I'm absolutely delighted now to be joined by Dr. Ian Thompson. Dr. Thompson, welcome. Nice to be here. Thanks nice for having me on this glorious Southern California day in San Diego. Now, you've been involved with the Committee on the Guidelines for uh, Prostatectomy. Tell us a little bit about that work. Uh, the radiation after radical prostatectomy guideline began, my goodness, three, four years ago uh, as the American Society of Therapeutic Radiation Oncology, ASTRO. That's the member organization like the AUA for the radiation oncologists. So ASTRO and the AUA got together and said, this is an important area for us to develop a guideline to educate our physicians, to bring together evidence-based practice for our physicians to benefit our patients. And it's been a, having done guidelines for the AUA for a long time, the way that the AUA and ASCO, ASTRO developed this guideline is uh, second to none. Extremely evidence-based, multidisciplinary, great group of people, great support, and it's a great guideline. So what's in the guidelines? Well, the guideline uh, focuses on patients who have had a radical prostatectomy. So th they, this is only for those patients who have already had surgery for prostate cancer, which we know is probably 60%, 65, maybe even as many as 70% of people who have been treated for prostate cancer. And so it asks the question, what do you do for the patient who is at high risk after prostatectomy for disease recurrence? Part one. And part two, what do you do for the patient who develops a PSA recurrence afterwards? And so that's the structure of the guideline. It includes some other sorts of practice elements that are important. For example, before you do a prostatectomy, as you're explaining to the patient, and I do this all the time, as you're explaining to the patient, one approach to the management of prostate cancer is a radical prostatectomy. But understand that when the prostatectomy is done, we get the pathology report back. There may be some features on the pathology report that may say you're at higher risk. And so after your surgery, we'll have a conversation about whether or not you'd be interested in radiation. So Dr. Thompson, how practical are these guidelines? I ask because there are 17, 18,000 people here, literally from all over the world. They need these guidelines to be practical. Yeah, I, I think it's very, they're extremely practical. We have specific levels of PSA on which to do things. We have a standard. So standard is that everybody should do it. And I personally, who and I'm counseling patients with prostate cancer, I personally, um, none of us are perfect, but I certainly try every single time to tell a patient in advance. You know, you can have, for example, for high risk features, you can have radiation, but I would be adding on hormones to that for high-risk patients because of level one evidence. And I tell them if I'm going to have a prostatect, if you're going to have a prostatectomy, there is a chance we may have a discussion afterwards that radiation may be in your best interest. So all of the elements of this guideline are very, very um, specific, very easy to incorporate. None are well, very few of them are 100% proscriptive. So for example, um, the patient who has very high risk features and whom we know, level one evidence, three randomized trials, that adjuvant radiotherapy significantly reduces the risk of disease recurrence. The guideline doesn't say, thou shalt give radiation. It does say, thou shalt have a conversation with the patient so the patient can understand the risks and benefits. And what we're really trying to accomplish is to make sure that every patient, this is why you know we're in the business to make sure that our patients are as well informed as we are so that they can make a decision for themselves based on their own priorities. Now finally, this is a big conference for guidelines on uh, prostate cancer. We've had your own guidelines, we've had guidelines on testing. Why do you think it is now that we're getting all these guidelines coming together? Well, it's, um, I have an easy job. I do oncology, predominantly prostate cancer. Most urologists have a broad range. I mean, if you can imagine the special, why do people stream into urology, want to participate, nice patients, great practice, you can help people, but you have 
stones, infertility, incontinence, infection, you have oncology, you have a hypogonadism, and the field is exploding, and the number of different treatments are exploding, the population is exploding, and the publications in those areas are going up exponentially. So how does a practicing urologist who does it all, you know, may practice in a small town in the UK or a small town in, 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 in Europe or a small town in South Texas, or even in a big city where they, they manage all that range of space, how do they distill all that information that's published in hundreds of journals and come up with a rational recommendation on what to do for an individual patient. It's really difficult. All you have to do is look at the, even the guidelines themselves. I mean, the AUA's guideline and the Preventive Services Task Force guideline, they're not exactly the same, are they? So you need your organization like the AUA to put those together, to distill those down so that you can look at how you should practice in the best fashion to make sure your patients have the best outcomes. Dr. Thompson, thank you very much indeed for joining us today on AUA TV. Thank you. It's my thank pleasure. You.